Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. This is our first meeting. So I want to welcome everyone. Uh, so the um, summit this year is on knowledge graphs. Having some difficulty adjusting this. Give me a second. Okay, so um, uh, knowledge graphs is our theme. Knowledge graphs have emerged roughly the last decade um, as an important area in industry, and it's also an active area in the research community. Uh, this knowledge graphs is critical to many. Uh, in many areas, but especially in areas like virtual assistants, which have become quite popular. The question then becomes, what is a knowledge graph anyway? So in this introductory series, what we will be doing is attempting to understand this field. So what is a knowledge graph, the definition, uh, some of the history of knowledge graphs, uh, those standards efforts that are uh, taking place in this area, as well as relationships to other notions of which there are very many. The uh, main series will begin at next year in January. Uh, the, uh, the relationship between this introductory series here in the fall and the main series is that we are going to be organizing the main series in the context of the lessons we learn uh, during the fall series. So some of the relevant areas that we have identified are inference, interoperability, representation and storage, visualization, and system, and metaphor. So uh, the, it is not the intention of the introductory series to cover all of these relevant areas. Rather, the introductory series is concerned with the um, areas I mentioned on the previous slide, namely definition, definition, history, standards, and relationships to other notions. But it would still be nice if during some of the sessions in uh, the fall, we also cover some of those relevant areas. And I, I imagine uh, uh, Jans today will be giving us some nice demonstrations about uh, visualization, for example. Uh, so Jans is going to be our first speaker. Uh, John Sawa is uh, scheduled for next week. Um, I don't yet know exactly what his title is going to be. Uh, Guha is going to be speaking later. And we also hope to get speakers talking about standards efforts and some of the research and development projects that are going on. In addition to what Jans will be telling us today. Now Jans, is our speaker today to introduce him. Uh, he'll be talking on why knowledge graphs hit the hype cycle and what they have in common. Uh, he's the CEO of Franz Incorporated, leading supplier of graph database products that provide the storage layer for powerful reasoning and ontology modeling capabilities for knowledge graph applications. So, um, Jans has been a popular and famous speaker at numerous knowledge graphs conferences. So he's the ideal person to be our first speaker in the uh, summit. So I will now ask Jans if you can start. Uh, I, also, I also want to speak for one or two seconds, Jans. Uh, I okay. welcomed you many times in 
many conferences, including the Library of Congress Digital Library Initiative. I use your Sparkle. I used till about two, three years ago. I hope you are still giving it free. And your name is based on Sanskrit. It is called Hans Asman, which means the the particular hunts bird that flies in the sky. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. I sometimes I'll get be here. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much for that introduction. All right, so I'll take it away from here. Um, so I want to share my screen. Okay, uh, I think this is my screen. Here's my PowerPoint. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk for the next, um, I would say, 40 minutes. Uh, I hope that we uh, can have a lot of time for discussion. Also, um, please interrupt me if you want to ask anything. Now, the problem is I, I don't know how I can look at a raised hand if I'm actually looking at my own screen. So, Ken, maybe if you see someone raising a hand for something serious, serious question, then uh, please just interrupt me. Would that be would that work? Yes, I'll take care of it. I'm I'm looking at the. Uh, yeah. I have two okay. screens, so I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then I'll start. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, our company has been around for a, a while. Uh, we are still a common Lisp and a Prolog compiler company. Um, and for the last twelve years, we've been completely focused on Allegro Graph. Our, our, our semantic graph database. And um, what we see is that we, we are a product company, but for the last two, three years, actually our revenues have gone way more in the direction of providing services and helping other companies build their knowledge graphs. So, um, <clears throat> so we are a commercial company and um, knowledge graphs started to take off and Gartner started to notice in only in 2018 that knowledge graphs were important and that companies were actually using knowledge graphs for real business. And then within, oh, within a year, the knowledge graphs moved all the way from here to very high up in the, in, in the hype cycle. I, I think I talked last year for at least four different Gartner analysts um, to talk about the kinds of knowledge graphs that we built. So, yeah, even the, the analytics companies are taking a, a note of, of, of this development. Now, what is a knowledge graph? <clears throat> so I was preparing for this talk yesterday, and, it, and it's something that happened to me before, but I was trying to find a definition on the web yeah, that's not an ideology or vendor-based or very application-specific, but you just can't find a good definition of a knowledge graph. Now, I have one, but uh, I'll get to that later. And so um, we at France worked on at least six, six different knowledge graphs uh, in the last three years. Um, so that gives me a little bit of authority to, to give my definition of a knowledge graph. Plus, I've been attending a lot of conferences. Uh, there was a really nice conference last year in Colombia uh, on knowledge graphs, and they will have a new one in, um, <clears throat> in 2020, I believe. Um, and then here in the Bay Area, just two weeks ago, we had a knowledge graph conference uh, organized by LinkedIn in a meetup, and literally all the big ones showed up from Google, IBM, Airbnb, uh, LinkedIn. I think the only one that didn't show up was Facebook. Anyway, so a lot of activity there. But as I said, there's not, it's not easy to find a, um, a definition, but you have to just uh, well, learn by example. So let me give you some examples, first from the really big companies and then from our customers. And then I'll come with my own definition. And so Knowledge Graph, uh, sorry, Google was the company that coined the term Knowledge Graph. And so now you know that if you type something in Google, then usually you see on the right-hand side a, a nicely formatted area. And that is actually all coming directly from Google's knowledge graph. Um, and if the, the knowledge graph at Google even knows about knowledge graphs, so if you type in knowledge graph in Google, then actually you get also the knowledge graph here. Yeah, it's a, it's a, 
And by the way, look at this. The knowledge graph is a knowledge base. So it's almost like a circular definition here used, used by Google and services to enhance its search engine results. Um, but from my talks with the people at Google, I know that the knowledge graph has at least 70 billion facts uh, running uh, in, in, in the kind of a triple store that they have. And it's running on several thousand machines because every time when you do a search, they have to go to the knowledge graph to find the additional knowledge that they want to display on your web page. Um, and then Apple got somewhat behind in uh, when compared to Google. If you look at Google Now compared to Siri, then Google Now is way, way, way more specific. So um, Apple just bought a small company called Lattice for 10, 20 engineers and paid $200 million for it. So about $10 million per knowledge graph engineer. So if you get tired of your job, then there's always something else to do that pays more. But anyway, so Apple is now building a knowledge graph. And in the presentation that I was in two weeks, they talked about how they were using Wikidata to build their own uh, uh, knowledge graph that they, they can use for Siri. Um, LinkedIn has a huge team of people that built their own distributed uh, social graph database. And the ap first application that they have is what they call the economic graph, the, or the, the economic uh, knowledge graph. And basically, they've taken all the information, the, the 610 million members, the 50,000 skills in their taxonomy, the 30 million companies, the open jobs, and everything else you can think of, and it's all in one huge graph database. And then they can do very, very interesting uh, uh, analytics. So in this meeting two weeks ago, they showed queries like, okay, so where are jobs for data science moving to right now? Um, if I want to have this kind of job, what area should I be in? Find me people that work both at IBM and at Google and, and stuff like that. So a really wide range of queries. Uh, oh, yeah, how far? How many steps does it take for me to be connected to Ken? Questions like that, and it's, um, uh, yeah, I was I was really really enamored by the the depth of what LinkedIn is right now doing with their uh, economic knowledge graph. Then Amazon, I've seen two talks by Amazon uh, recently about um, their knowledge graph. This is an older presentation from 2017. It's about the product knowledge graph. Uh, they actually make a distinction between the, the knowledge graph and the product graph. The knowledge graph is more uh, general world knowledge yeah, without any reference to a product. So if you want to say, Alexa, play the music by Michael Jackson, and you don't care about what products are used to, dis or, or to play the music. You just want to listen to the music. So, and then they have the product graph um, where they literally take any product in their assortment and they have an ontology and, a, and, a, and a, a part of a taxonomy that they then use to encode each of these products. And then they mix it together like this. So on the one hand, you have the knowledge graph where you, for example, know that uh, uh, Tom Hanks starred in, in this, uh, but then you add to it the product graph where there's actually things on the left-hand side that you can buy and that is linked to the general knowledge. So they found it kind of important in that meeting to make the distinction between a product graph and a knowledge graph. I still don't know entirely why that is. And then here is a picture of the architecture that they use. And the main reason I'm, I'm using it here um, is that you see at the bottom so they really have huge ontologies to describe products. You can imagine how important that is. Um, and then it goes all the way through knowledge cleaning into the product graph. And then on top of that, they do all the, 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 the smart stuff that you would expect. Um, what is missing from this picture is the word taxonomy. And, but in the talk that I went to, most of the talk actually was about taxonomies and how the domain that they're working on is so incredibly big that they have, or they are developing all kinds of methods to do automatic derivation of taxonomies. So that's uh, also a, a really nice uh, research topic that I haven't seen much about yet. Anyway, so this is the, the, the architecture. Then Airbnb was there, talk about uh, how they have 5 million homes on Airbnb. And if you want to give a 
travel or the best experience, you need to really understand every facet of your uh, of, of a particular offering and the environment of that offering and well everything else you can think about where a particular uh, uh, room or, or, or house is located. And again, they use taxonomies and, and ontologies. Anyway, so these are the the big internet companies that all start building their own knowledge graph. This was a picture taken from at the Knowledge Graph Conference in Colombia. The only reason I'm showing it is here is here was the program, and here you see that also regular companies, like uh, the, and especially the financial companies, are building now their knowledge graphs. So uh, Goldman Sachs gave a talk about the conference. Capital One gave a talk about it. Wells Fargo, etc. Yeah. So knowledge graphs are in. Um, now let me do a quick check. Ken, is uh, is everything working fine? Can you guys hear me and see the things? Yeah, everything looks great. Okay, all right. Okay, thanks. Hey, Ken. So then let's talk. About Kenneth. Hello. Oh, sorry, Todd. Yes, I posted a question. Um, could you present it? Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, the question is: Why is taxonomy distinguished from ontology? Um. Well, um, I mean, that's a very good question, but I'm, I'm here in the ontology forum, so you guys might have a lot of opinions about that. But I mean, the way I usually describe it is ontologies are used to describe objects, almost like it's an object-oriented definition, yeah, with the, all the attributes of a particular object that define that object or class of objects. And a taxonomy is more about the the linguistic relationships between concepts, but then again, every concept in an ontology should also be described in the taxonomy in most cases. Yeah, and so I see more and more cases where, say, a SCOS taxonomy is mixed with an owl ontology. Especially in healthcare, I have a lot of examples of how um, those things are mixed. Uh, uh, yeah, where you have the taxonomic relationship between diseases, say a mesh and SNOMED and UMLS, but then a disease or a drug or a procedure might also have some properties. Uh, and those are more the ontology, on, ontologic nature of these products. I hope that, that, that helps a little bit. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, let me continue. So what are the knowledge graphs that we built with our customers? So. I'm going to show you, uh, talk a little bit about, well, I'll first give you an overview and then I'll dive into two of them. Uh, we have, we're building a knowledge graph for uh, Noam Chomsky. Yeah, so it's a, a, a knowledge graph about all the work that he ever published as a book or as articles and uh, also about what other people said about Chomsky. Yeah, so it's it's product, it's a, a a project that is uh, sponsored by the Internet Archive here in San Francisco. Pool Party in Austria is, is uh, supporting it. We are supporting it at France. And then there's a Chomsky Legacy Project, some individuals in San Francisco that brought some money together to build those knowledge, that knowledge graph. Another knowledge graph uh, that we help a startup with is uh, also extremely interesting. It's what we call the Beauty Graph. <clears throat> Uh, most of you won't know, but there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars per year spent on beauty products. The average woman has close to 10 products that she puts on her body um, occasionally. And uh, the average man is, I think, right now get, is getting to about 3.6 products. <laughs> uh, if you go on to, to these products online, yeah, in, in the product offerings of Amazon or eBay or Google Shopping, uh, you'll find always a list of ingredients. Um, each product has, on average, I would say 20 ingredients. One of them is aqua water, which is harmless. Then you have the other 19 ingredients, where each ingredient has at least 10 synonyms. Um, and each of these ingredients, if you go on the web, you'll find that if you take too much of that ingredient, there will be negative health effects. 
So this startup is trying to come up with a, a way to have a health score for every beauty product, also based on your personal uh, features, like if you're allergic to something, yeah, then it can give you recommendations on what you can use, what you cannot use, where the animals were used. Uh, but anyway, a beautiful, beautiful project. Then uh, the bigger knowledge graphs that we work at at France uh, is one where we um, help a big call center company in Atlanta, uh, where we build a knowledge graph around. So if you're a call center, yeah, then you usually call a lot of companies yeah, to try to sell things. But you call that company many, many times. Yeah? And so we're in the process of building up a knowledge graph around every company that you ever call to learn about what people are there, what products are they using, what is their inclinations, what are their intentions, what are they reading, um, what are they saying. Um, but we also do a lot of NLP on the uh, spoken and, um, and text conversations just in the call center agents and the customers. So we're doing a lot of uh, taxonomy driven speech recognition here at France. So we can so we take text uh, sorry, spoken conversation, turn it into a text, and then do NLP on top of that. And the end result is that while an agent is in the call, we can already start giving useful suggestions like, oh, um, you haven't talked about the authority yet, or you haven't talked about uh, whether they have a timeline yet. Or we can say, well, uh, the customer is talking about this product. You might want to then mention this other product. Yeah. So it's all about making the call center people smarter. Um, and then a big project that we also work on for the last four years, and I think I've already presented this project a while back uh, at this forum, is with a hospital in the Bronx called Montefiore, where we have a knowledge graph around patients, yeah, where we take all the data you can imagine about the patient, from vital signs to test diagnostics, procedures, uh, medications, uh, checking in, checking out, um, dietary information, et cetera, et cetera, and we turn it all into a graph that is centered around the patient, and then we make it, because of the setup that we have, orders of magnitude easier to query the database. Um, and again, I hope that I have some time to talk about it today again. Then we work with um, Deloitte. Um, so Deloitte in Germany is building knowledge graphs where you um, um, take a bill of material for a car, for example, turn that into a graph, and then you look at the logistics chain and the vendors and the manufacturers. But you also look at uh, catastrophic events in particular parts of the world where a vendor or a manufacturer is located, and you try to come up with a risk score for your uh, production processes to see whether your just-in-time uh, system uh, is at risk because of something happening, in a flood in Thailand, for example. A really, really cool project. I uh, could talk for hours about that one, and I'll skip the last one. So this is a little bit of an overview of the kind of um, uh, uh, knowledge graphs that we work on. So let me now then first talk about the, the Chomsky knowledge graph, because in this forum that might be a fun topic. Um, so <clears throat> what is the goal of this product project? Well, to begin with, um, Chomsky is uh, 93, and won't be here that long anymore. And uh, so a group of people decided that they really, really wanted to make sure that this whole intellectually intellectual legacy is preserved. And so, um, so we, we're now building an infrastructure for knowledge graphs for public personalities. And if you want to, for YouTube, yeah, I mean, so that is the overall goal. And the Chomsky Legacy Project had this very practical goal that they wanted to make it easy for journalists and students and researchers and what have you to navigate this work. Um, well, and then from our perspective, what we want to do is to know everything what Chomsky ever said or wrote, what others wrote about him, uh, what other people said about it, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine what you want to do. Um, so let's just take an example. So you have the book Media Control that some of you might have read. Uh, which is about how the media can influence large groups in the population to think uh, crazy things. Yeah, and um, here's a simple example. Yeah, um, if you look at the Iran nuclear deal, yeah, 
if uh, Iran, uh, according to the Chomsky yeah, philosophy, if Iran exits the nuclear deal, then it's violating the deal. If the U.S. leaves the deal, then it withdraws. Yeah, and if you go through all the newspaper articles after this happened, it was kind of very interesting to see how the language completely was different depending on what 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 point you look at. Um, and then, although this is more of a joke, yeah, this is about a statement from the press secretary. It was a mistake under the Iran nuclear deal to allow Iran to enrich uranium. But at any level, there's little doubt that even before the deal's existence, Iran was violating its terms. Anyway, it's about using the media and describing things in such a way that people, that you change people's minds. So this is, um, so we have a book like that. And let me now just give you a little demo of how we put something like that in the database. So here we have a tool called uh, Gruff that is running on top of Allegro Graph that has um, a few sample books and, and newspaper articles in there plus everything else. Uh, is there, Ken, is there a question? Uh, I believe Ravi had a question. How far is your real customer support, real, real customer support from case-based reasoning? Uh, can, can, can you say that again? How far? Yeah, this is what Ravi wrote in the chat. How far is your real-time customer support from case-based reasoning? I guess just, uh, you know, to what extent is what you're doing based on case-based reasoning, what your company's doing? Um, well, this is one, one project. And um, in this case, we, we, we're not doing case-based reasoning yet because that's- uh, I, just, I just meant to say that Usually, people were using case-based reasoning while answering the customer by going into their own knowledge base and extracting the relevant uh, information for the customer. So how far is your technique uh, more beneficial than the case-based reasoning approach? It's essentially trees and graphs which, uh, with which you trace relevance yeah. of the question of the customer to the knowledge base of the supplier well in, in our case um, the first practical thing we do is we take an, an article in a newspaper yeah and we say to what extent which of the books or articles by Chomsky relate the closest to this particular book and we do this by having several measures of similarity by looking at the overlap of the people mentioned, the location mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, important concepts mentioned, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not traditional case-based reasoning, but it allows people to very quickly go to the relevant parts of Chomsky's work to get to the right book and paragraph in Chomsky's book. Let, let me just give you a little example. Maybe it gets clearer later what we do. Yeah. So I'm, so the Chomsky Legacy Project itself is working on a GUI, just a web page where you can say, give me everything about this particular concept of murder and the word South Africa. Yeah. And it will use, use the taxonomy and do some inference about all the uh, synonyms and, and broader than narrower of, of murder. Same thing for South Africa. And then do a, partly a text search, partly a, a graph search to find the relevant uh, uh, topics. So let, let me give you an example. Example. So here I'm looking for um, the the um, the classes in the system. So this, this answers. There's a book with interviews. So we have an answer object. There's books, chapters, concepts, interviews, journalists, locations, publishers, paragraphs, persons, etc. Anyway, I'll take a book. Let's go to media control. Uh, here's media control. So now we have the book Media Control, and we we'll double click it to get all the features. Oh, let me do this. This is not nice. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm going to go back here. Let's just do it this way. 
So I can look at some chapters, dissident culture, public relations, uh, the journalist from Mars, yeah. <clears throat> so we took every book. So doing NLP on the entire concept of a book is really completely useless in my opinion. So what we do is we create an ontology for books and articles where you have a book that has um, chapters, but chap chapters, and then there's paragraphs and and for us, the paragraph is the central element on which we do all our analytics. So I could look at public relations and um, I could look at some paragraphs, just random paragraphs. So now I have that. <clears throat> and I could look at a particular paragraph and I could say, so what is the person in there? Is Edward Bernays or um, what are important concepts? What are the categories? Politics or work? Well. Not, not, not that interesting, but let's put it there anyway. Or what are some uh, <clears throat> of the important concepts here? Africa, business capitalism, uh, South Africa, war, political parties, industrial sector. And so here you see um, how we go deeper. So this is from book to chapter to paragraphs, then we go into the um, the concepts that an entity extractor got out of the paragraph. If we want to look at the paragraph itself, I could look at the content here. And we're not going to read it now, but this is actually the content in this particular um, <clears throat> in this in this particular paragraph that we got all these these uh, these elements from. <clears throat> and then I could look at what is in the work of Chomsky related to South Africa. If so we compute co-occurrence between every concept in the work of, of Noam Chomsky and then do a co-occurrence and then we correct the co-occurrence for how often he talks about one of the two terms in the co-occurrence anyway. And then you get a measure called odds ratio that we use in, in many different applications here at France for knowledge graphs. And so here I can see what are things related to uh, South Africa. Um, and I can uh, say from and to. And so here you see, I think, here's, here's some statistical relationships that of things related to South Africa. So let me select those and let me see the, the predicate from and to. Hey, shift B, oh, shift B, from and to, and then I, and here you see, um, yeah, so if, if Noam Chomsky talks about South Africa, then He's also very, very likely to talk about Nelson Mandela or uh, the Washington Post or the, L or the LA or the Los Angeles Times. Yeah. So, um, and then we can look at Washington Post and we can say in what paragraphs these things then actually happened. This in what failed states, he talks about it, global discontents, the hegemony, uh, I, sorry, my, pardon my Dutch, hegemony of survival. <laughs> Manufacturing consents, all the different books, uh, paragraphs in books. And then another thing, we can look for everything and always say, okay, so how is this paragraph actually similar to another paragraph somewhere? And I can select the predicate for that, which is uh, from similar paragraph. And let's see if there's a relationship with media control. Okay, I took a wrong example here. Okay, so we find that if I want to look at the relationship between this chapter and this thing here, I have to go through similarity of failed states, manufacturing consent, and then media control. Anyway, this is not very meaningful what I do right now, but I just want to give you an impression of um, how we can actually use <clears throat> all the various elements in, the, uh, in this knowledge graph. Any questions about this? Oh, this is probably not the right person. Any questions about this? Okay. Uh, so, there are some questions, but um, I don't know if they're specifically about what you what you just demonstrated. Okay. I can ask. Uh, I can ask a, a question that is in my mind is, it is what you are showing as graphs, um, uh, like up to entity extraction, are based on taxonomy. But if yeah. you could convert the 
the text uh, original information in two triples, then you would be doing that based on ontology. Sorry, this is uh, what you're seeing here is all triples. So uh, I, I don't understand the question, I guess. So there was well, a... that tri the triples uh, address uh, ontology rather than taxonomy because you're talking of objects and relationships among yeah. them. So yeah. it is actually ontology based. Yeah. So what you're looking, yeah, we have an ontology for books and, we, and, and, and uh, articles. We have an ontology then for uh, the elements of a paragraph. Yeah. And the elements of the, yeah. So we have an ontology for that. That is correct. And then you have concepts like war and capitalism. And, and this, if I look, just look at war, this war is actually part of a taxonomy, so of a SCOS taxonomy. So if I click on war, and I will probably find an, uh, the alt labels just in, in the database, 28 alt labels for the word war, which you really need if you want to do um, uh, entity extraction. Yeah, so I can look at some alt labels for war, armed conflict, cause of war, military action. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and there's probably also a narrower and then broader for this. Oh, yeah, there's nine narrowers of this, proxy war, invasion, cold war, civil war, revolutions, world war. So we build our own taxonomy. It's, it's actually, again, it's, it's almost more a folksonomy, folksonomy than a taxonomy, but still very important for us to be able to do intelligent queries over the database. Yeah. So here we see that we actually dive from the triple media control has this concept war, and then we dive into the, the, the taxonomy part. I hope that is clear. Uh, yes, in this depiction, but if you were to take any one of these boxes, they would feed back into some of the other boxes rather than go one direction only. And that would be ontology depiction. Feedback or relationship back to these other entities. Yes, yes. Well, because it's triples, you can go in both directions at all times. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. So, um, okay. So that's the end of my this demo. Let's see how much time. Oh, I'm almost. Okay. Well. Okay. Let me then just go a little bit more. So, all the technology, the, the components that are we're building for these uh, public personality systems. Of course, there's the semantic graph database behind all of this. We have an ontology of books, chapters, paragraphs, articles, authors. We do a lot of taxonomies and taxonomy building, and we're using a tool called Pool Party. We also have a tool called Smart Logic, but for this we have a, a Pool Party. So here you see the uh, the tree that Vietnam War is uh, basically a cold proxy war, which is a, a, a cold war proxy war, which is a, a child of proxy wars, which is child of war, which is child of Hard power, which is a, 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 a has a broader power, etc. Yeah, so so we build these taxonomies <clears throat> in this tool, and then we load that into our Allegro graph, and then from there on we use that for our entity processing. So let me go. Yeah, so we do NLP and entity extraction on the paragraphs, as I just said. We enrich it with public knowledge, so DBpedia, GeoNames, Census, public databases. You just saw me pop up. The the picture of Nelson Mandela. Um, we do advanced statistics and machine learning on it to get similarity measures and, and odds ratios. One thing we haven't done yet is the causality graph. I mean, you know, Chomsky makes a lot of claims about A causes B and then B and C cause D, etc. So there's a group of volunteers starting to go through the work of Noam Chomsky to find these causality reasoning, these chains and put it as a graph in the database, yeah? And then we can do semantic search, and I don't have the GUI for the available right now, but if you, you can look for violent attack on people, and then we also look for more specific concepts like murder and poisoning, etc. So I demoed this already. So another way to show what we do in this particular knowledge graph is, uh, so we start with text, email, or chats. We have documents, yeah? Um, we even have voice to text. Yeah, we, we ingest it all in Allegro graphs. So now you have just a simple node, a triple where it says uh, document one has content, 
and then a bunch of text, yeah, one triple. And usually in a call center, you have more information over the book. Or the, you might have for a book, you have a book title, uh, a paragraph identifier. For a call center, you have the what time the call, the chat was made, and the person that made the chat, and who was called. But you start with the blog text. Then we um, uh, have the taxonomy, yeah, and that we make in an external to put it, put it into a Lego graph or in a knowledge graph. We give the taxonomy and the text to an entity extractor, and it gives you entities back, like persons, concepts, locations that I just showed you about. Of course, we do a sentiment analytic analysis. We also have a taxonomy-based sentiment analyzer, so we give the taxonomy and the text. We give sentiments back. Um, sometimes we label, we, have, we use explicit labeling, ex especially in the call center. You want to know whether a chat was for an immediate sale or a request for technical help or someone wants to upgrade the system. So we have people go through every chat and label it as in a particular category. And then you have an, a, a text classifier that then where the text classification is also stored in the knowledge graph. And then when you even while you're doing a call in the call center, you already can use the text classifier to say, oh, this is an immediate sale. Please use this telephone number to help the customer go to a, a, a partner or a, a seller. Um, as I said, we do a lot of analytics on this or our, our statistics. So we look at entities and sentiments and we, we compute core occurrences and correlations, put that back in the database and, uh, and then we make everything available from the knowledge graph in the REST in the REST interface so we can do well whatever we want to do with this. So this is just one application that I have time for today and it's now already 940. So let's start with the questions. Yeah, I, I yeah I could talk for five minutes about can what, what do you want me to do? I can talk five minutes about our case in healthcare or I can just we can just start talking about the one example that I just had. Actually, um, what I would like to do is invite you to give another talk in the main series. So we're we're going to have a main series of talks starting yeah. in January. Yeah. And uh, in particular, we would like to have a healthcare track. Okay. Well, so that would be great. Can, would you be able to attend that? Are you able to give a presentation? Of course. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah, okay. That's, that's so. We do have questions. Okay, now I can find the, the chat screen. One second, give me a second. Yeah, I see it. I believe Todd asked a couple of questions. And he has his hand up. Todd, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Jans, thank you for the presentation. It's quite interesting to say the least. Um, yeah. I'm glad you Thank agree you. that there's no common definition of this notion of knowledge graph. Uh, all of us on this on this call and in this group probably have our own particular interpretations of that notion. And for myself, it usually uh, includes some notion of uh, structure or, shall we say, an analysis of the underlying notions. Um, I uh, I agree with Barry Smith that we shouldn't use the notion concept. Or use the term concept, but use the use, use the term so, notion. So, Todd, can, can I can I interrupt you for one second? So, thank you very much for the question, because I suddenly realized that I I skipped the healthcare knowledge graph, but I did have two concluding slides exactly about what you were talking about. Oh. So, would yes, you allow me to talk? Certainly, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. So, um, so can you guys see my slides? So. Um, so after having been to many talks about knowledge graph and building our own knowledge graphs, the only thing I can come up with is that a knowledge graph is a system that tries to know and learn everything it can about an entity of interest to improve or internal processes, customer experience, or health. Yeah. Um, and I also find that there's only usually a very small set of classes of entities that you care about. So in healthcare, it's the patient. In the beauty graph, it's ingredients, actually. Um, it can be a product and a customer or a patient and a provider, but it's, it's knowledge centered around a small class of, of elements. And then it always includes a semantic graph. Some people try to do it without semantics, but most of them use a semantic graph. And there's always an ontology, and there's always taxonomies. 
Sometimes very simple taxonomy. Sometimes people spend a lot of time on that. And there's always identity management. Uh, and, and by that, I mean if you make a knowledge graph for a particular company and you have all these silos of information where you get your data from, the only way you can build a knowledge graph if you agree what the IDs are of the entities that you care about. Yeah. So in most what? companies, you might have a thousand databases and you only have relational databases in a relational database about the same person, you can have different IDs. And it's very, very hard to combine databases because you never can agree about the IDs of the, the things you want to get together. So anyway, that's, uh, that, that's what we always see in these semantic graphs. And then it nearly always includes machine learning, natural language processing, and text classification. And more and more, we see knowledge graph that you can talk to, yeah, where you have taxonomy-driven speech recognition. Okay, okay, so Todd, thanks very much. That was that was my little. Oh, and well, why we, why now? Well, graph databases are now accepted as the best technology technology to store complex semantic data. I mean, all these other databases that we have there are good in their own, yeah. But if you have really complex data in knowledge graphs, then I mean, it's it's called knowledge graphs for a reason. <laughs> um, what I also see about semantics is all the big companies now have taxonomies. Literally every big 500 company has a has at least one taxonomist, probably more. Ontology is still a little bit scary, yeah, the, because of the the owl history. Um, entity extraction NLP are almost a commodity now. I'm guessing most people know about this beautiful, beautiful Python system called Spacey, yeah. But there's things Google made BERT available, this IBM and natural language understanding. So applying NLP becomes really easy, yeah, and then. If you want to do machine learning, advanced analytics, no, you still need data scientists, but it's most of the stuff is now just available in the cloud. But the most important reason is we finally got enough people that can put it all together. Okay, Todd, now over to you. Um, well, um, one, okay, in, in among the, your items on the why now, I think one of the bigger drivers is the amount of data that's floating around and people really don't have a good way to handle it. But back to my questions. Um, are you using in your work any particular representation languages? And then um, that entails, if you're using a particular representation language, uh, any particular types of reasoners? Well, we do everything. Uh, all our work is in RDF and OWL. Um, that is representation language. And yes, we have a, we use, uh, we have, we do simple RDF, what we call RDFS plus plus reasoning. Where we don't do it's like owl, but we don't do uh, intersections and uh, oh. intersections and unions. Um, but we do have a full materializer, so sometimes that comes in really, really handy. But then, of course, you do in the in, when you do semantic search, you use the taxonomy inference, yeah, using going through a broader and narrower and and, and uh, related to concepts. Um, that's a kind of reasoning too. And then we have what we do a lot because OWL can do only some of the kind of reasoning you want to do. We yeah. use a lot of Prolog. Ah, yeah, I would expect. Uh, so just two yeah. more questions. Um, are you using any foundational ontologies uh, in your work? Well, uh, in healthcare, we use 182 existing healthcare taxonomies and ontologies. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, yes. Foundational ontologies like either oh. UFO or Dolce or UFO. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. And then my, my last question has to do with the way ontologies develop. Um, could you go back one slide? Um, back how much? Um, no, I guess. Um, well, never mind my last question. My brain just derailed here. So I'll let other people ask. I'm sorry, but thank you very much, Jans. All right. Okay, Todd. Okay. Uh, actually, Jeanette Wong had a question. Jeanette. Jeanette. You have to mute by doing start six. Let me see if I can do it. Okay, I, I am muted, Jeanette. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, th thank you very much. It was an interesting uh, demo um, because I haven't seen many knowledge graphs demo. I just wanted to get one point straight. 
um, and that is what you were showing is it that once you have built your knowledge graph and with uh, a number of these ontologies as your kind of underlying foundation and, and taxonomies, what you have shown is once the graph is built, then a user can go to the GUI that you showed and navigate through the graph to explore the knowledge about all the works by, uh, by Chomsky. I think that, that that was what you were doing. I think because you allow a lot of selection, you know, once you get to a certain node, then you bring up a dialogue box and then, you know, to narrow down things and so on. Because what, what I meant is, what I meant is that normally like a knowledge graph would be huge and there, there, there has to be a way to, um, to control the way that, uh, to make it practically be uh, practically navigable. Yeah. And I think you were showing that, uh, that, that is, that, that's what you, you, one aspect that you showed. So, so the tool that I show is Gruff. Gruff is not meant, I mean, so the goal of the project is to help journalists and, um, um, and, and research, well, journalists and, and, and politicians or whatever, to go to their website and type in keywords, et cetera, and get results back, and that the, that GUI is being developed, developed. The graph interface that I showed you is for analysts and researchers and people, well, that do the kind of work that the audience here today does. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit more technical, and you actually explore the graph. Yeah, so most. Um, it, it takes a little bit of time to get into graph to understand how uh, how you explore the graph, but once you can do it, it's extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think what you're saying is what you showed today, the demo, the audience is actually not necessarily the end user. No, this was this was a tool. This is a tool for for the for very technical. For, it's more for technical people. Yeah, it's, I see. For analysts that are willing to spend the time to learn how to use this tool and a lot and yeah i mean i see what you mean okay users everywhere that are really really interested in for example if you look at a causal network for diseases yeah there's no other way mm -hmm. to investigate that than using a tool like this oh see i, I see what you mean the other I, might, yeah. I have a second i have a second question if you don't mind um do you use any influencing capabilities of ontologies in this knowledge graph well, we we have an owl ontology for we have an owl ontology for books and paragraphs and concepts, so it's all described in an ontology, mm -hmm. um, and that's an owl ontology. And then we use a taxonomy uh, that's for from a company called, as I said, Pool Party. But then uh, we have all kinds of uh, taxonomies. Let me see if I can find it here. Here, yeah. And so what you saw today, as I pointed out, the Chomsky project. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I could look at the Cisco taxonomy. Yeah. So we, uh, for the call center, we're looking at Cisco products that are mentioned in conversations. Mm -hmm. Let's see this one here, and then yeah, it's totally different. Yeah, then then you start by building by taking the catalog. You take the catalog that they have, and then from there on, oh, let me do this, Cisco services. You go to the alt labels to make sure that the entity extractor can catch all the relevant, uh, all the other synonyms that might refer to the same concept. So that's where a lot of time is going then. But was it actually your question? Sorry, I, didn't, I don't think I answered your question. Well, can you say your question again? Um that no that that that's okay i think you were saying that um you use a lot of taxonomies but it, it doesn't maybe use a bit of inferencing I, I i was curious if you use a lot of inferencing capability in your knowledge graphs um only only for the tax taxonomic reasoning yeah following the um the broader and narrow uh and, and the sideways the related to things in, in Sparkle queries with path expressions. Okay. Um, if we have to do complex rules, I usually go back to Prolog yeah, okay. for really complicated algorithms. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. Another question. Yes, Ken. 
And should I go ahead? Go ahead, Ravi. Yeah. The uh, first of all, are you going to be kind enough to share your slides with us so that Ken can post them to the forum? Um, yeah, I can. I can uh, 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 give you these slides. Yes, and maybe the screenshot of the demo as well. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we'll oh, be yeah. great. That, that, uh, number two. Right now, one second. I'll print screen. Yeah. It's, uh, Thank you. Yeah. The other question is that just now you showed that Cisco uh, customer support base or something of that sort. That is where I was referring to the comparison with case-based reasoning and not for the Chomsky work, okay? Yeah. So, so I just, uh, it was a very general question to know how far, okay. we have come, how far we have come from the old case-based reasoning tools by using richer taxonomy, OWL, and navigation. Anyway. The last yeah. question, uh, last question is uh, that you had in uh, other presentations showed us uh, graphs, and these are not necessarily knowledge graphs, but they are ontology type graphs, which are showing the importance of a person or tracking a entity based on the number of relationships it has with other entities or based on the importance of the entity and these circles were bigger or smaller, they were color coded and they related to other circles through lines. You remember those which you develop using your tools and uh, for example, following a VIP personality and how many threads are related to it, etc. I remember clearly you showed those, but why were it was not shown today. Um, well, uh, I'll give a lot of demos, so I'm kind of looking for which one you meant. Um, but what you're referring to is where we do social network analytics. Yes, uh, that's one of them. Yeah, we do social network analytics, then we compute the, uh, the in and out degrees for every node in the system, and then you can uh, show you we, we can use pictures in graph so you can make the boxes bigger or smaller uh, or, or use symbols for 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 certain notes and then you can um, yeah show the importance of people and networks definitely yeah I've I've done demos like that I don't have one available right now no just uh, just uh, I was curious what were the technologies behind those so you answered some of them yeah, it's, it's, ah. it's we, we implemented most of the uh, measurements in the handbook of social network analytics. So. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay, we have some like, questions from Victor and Zachary. So are they Victor or Zachary? Uh, Victor. You. Yes, uh, I just am wondering uh, whether the ontologies, the, the sets of uh, entities and relationships are predetermined manually or uh, your initial language processing engine can extract some candidates from the texts uh, and uh, suggest them for uh, to be approved as new entities or new relationships which were not met in the original ontology, which was a taxonomy of entities. Um, so, please try the question again. I don't entirely understand where you're going with this. Can, can you try again? I'm just looking at the example for Chomsky, uh, yeah. Chomsky uh, graph and I'm wondering whether these relationships and entities uh, were they uh, uh, were they uh, made manually initially before the an analysis of the text, or they were extracted and suggested uh, from the text analysis, uh, like uh, the South Africa? Uh, was it uh, extracted by some person, or 
the software suggested that there are some uh, some uh, statements related to a new subject which probably is a candidate for the taxonomy part on, uh, for the ontology oh yeah that's that's a good question so um uh, we so so when you use this tool called pool party yeah what we did is we we read we had a set of volunteers working on this um, and this tool what you can do is you can do corpus analysis so you can build corpora create a corpus or, or load cor corpus and so basically you load in a, a lot of text from Chomsky or from articles and it will show in that tool every word it already recognizes but also the most frequent words that are not yet in your taxonomy and then you can drag manually those concepts in the right part of the tree of the taxonomy. So that's one part of the answer, is that a tool like Pool Party or Smart Logic will help you by looking at the entire corpus and come with suggestions of what words you also want to add to your taxonomy. But then there's a second thing, and that is that, um, and you can't see it really very well here, but we also took the text from a, a, this text here, and we sent the text to uh, IBM Natural Language Understanding. And so IBM Natural, so it's, uh, it's based on Watson, and it will find words that we didn't have in the taxonomy yet. And so what we then do is if we see, we do two things. One, we first try to do a textual analysis, like, okay, are the words exactly the same, like the name of a person or the name of location, et cetera. If not, then we also put it in our uh, taxonomy. Yeah, so we use IBM Watson to give our, yeah, well, IBM natural language understanding is based on IBM Watson, and we use that technology then to um, find new words that were not in the system yet, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Zachary? Identifiers, and uh, I'm, I'm seeing, are, are you hearing me, sorry? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I think the speaker partially answered it um, when they mentioned that uh, th they face challenging challenges when trying to merge or combine knowledge graphs uh, created by different parties. And, and you mentioned um, lack of agreement on identifiers for um, for entities uh, like like. Uh, so I was just curious if uh, if it's common to use persistent identifiers in, in constructing knowledge graphs. Well, so one thing I didn't get to because of time today, and I always have to stop, is I see two types of knowledge graphs. I see more textual-based knowledge graphs, and there you really rely on the identity of terms in your te taxonomies. And then you have data-driven, where you take silos in an enterprise and you try to uh, unify the data into a graph. And if you try to unify data, you have, you have the challenge, say you talk about the enterprise and you want to unify data, then you have to worry about, okay, is this person the same customer as that person? Yeah, so there's all kinds of mm -hmm. techniques to do entity disambiguation to find out um, what, if, if we're talking about the same customer in different databases. And in order to help with that process, you build registries where you take all the, the variants of a customer name or et cetera and put it in a registry. So you make it easier to come up with one canonical URL, but then in the in the if you think of the more textual knowledge graphs where you have uh, where you rely very much on taxonomies, yeah, then um, we developed several techniques, and uh, especially my my partner in Montefiore in the hospital, he took 100 this 182 taxonomies and he used a whole bunch of algorithms to for 99% unify them based on a, whether the text is the same, or B, or B, if a concept has exactly the same um, uh, uh, children and parents, yeah, then it's probably also the same, but then at least you're warned that you're not certain and a human being can decide. But yeah, there's a lot of art and science involved in to getting uh, um, to unify taxonomies, yeah, even in the same domain. So it's a good question, yeah, it's, it's an issue. Thank you. 
but guys, I uh, I, I have a, another appointment real soon, so I can do one more question. I think we've we've run out of time. An additional question might really run too long. In particular, Paul Tyson had a very interesting question that might take quite a bit of time. Is it possible for you to come to another session, perhaps in October, you know, and continue this discussion? Uh, if yeah, if the time works out, yeah, definitely. I'm very happy to help. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. we'll we'll uh, we'll uh, I'll try to arrange a. Um, in about a month. So we can continue this and Paul, we can answer your question then. So thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks Hans in particular. Okay. You've, you've, been, you've been great. And uh, thanks to everybody else who's been participating. So this is- All right.